Due Process, awarded the 2005 New York Emmy for Societal Concerns Programming. Please, who's going to kick my door in? Please, I'm fearful for my life. Can you please send somebody here now? She repeatedly called 911, but it took two hours for police to show up. By then, the former boyfriend was gone, but one week later, he came back, allegedly shot her dad, then kidnapped her and their baby. Domestic violence. Do cops and courts take it as seriously as they should? That's the question for this edition of Due Process. Major funding for Due Process provided by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law and by the Fund for New Jersey, a private foundation focusing on New Jersey public policy issues. Additional funding provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual and online legal reference, elaw.com. It's become a common headline. A woman attacked, even killed by a husband or lover, and all too often after she'd sought the protection of courts and police. I'm Raymond Brown, and on this edition of Due Process, Domestic Violence Official Response. Why does it so often seem to be too little and too late? We'll put that question to a former police lieutenant who's now an advocate for battered women and to a forensic social worker who studies domestic violence. But first, Sandy King's in Newark with a dramatic example of what can happen when a woman's pleas for help go unheeded. Raymond, the story's not a new one, not unique. It's elements all too common. A woman, a child, and a former boyfriend. Alleged threats, police calls, a court order. But it wasn't until a near tragic event with two lives apparently on the line that the rest of this story surfaced and shocked. A police chase ended here after a child abduction Amber Alert at 7 o'clock this morning, more than 50 miles away in Irvington. All day, while police and news helicopters circled overhead, it was a guns-drawn standoff fraught with all the elements for disaster. A man allegedly armed with a pistol, holding his ex-girlfriend and their baby in a car for more than six long hours, while hostage negotiators worked frantically to set them free. I, I thought I was going to die. Um, I didn't put up no fight. I didn't want to argue because I know anything I say, it would probably trigger him. Her father had already been shot. Now Erica Turner and her baby were apparently in danger in what looked like yet another sad story of failed relationship and domestic violence. He's sitting there with a gun in his lap, and the gun is pointing towards me. So I don't know what you're going to do. But it turned out there was a backstory too. Just one week before, a terrorized Erica at home with her parents fearfully dialing 911 and dialing again, but getting no response, while Almuda Saunders allegedly stormed and threatened just outside her door. Please, I have a restraining order. Please, who's going to kick my door in? Please, okay. I'm fearful for my life. Can you please send somebody here now? Okay. And the story didn't start or end there. She'd obtained a restraining order, and just that day, she'd been to police headquarters, complaining about Saunders yet again. Then he allegedly showed up, just as she'd feared. So that same day, she makes, investigation is revealed, a dozen 911 calls. They're all blown off, and there's different reasons given for, for, for blowing her off on every, on, every, on every occasion. I think he got it thank you. There was a mention of a restraining order, we believe, between three and seven times. There was a mention of a gun 
three times and there was approximately a dozen phone calls. But for more than two hours, there was no car sent, as Irvington dispatchers gave explanations like this. Right now, we really, really do not have nobody. And I've been trying my best to get a car car to ya, and we really do not have nobody. So we asked Mayor Wayne Smith for his take on what went wrong. The call was handled uh, inappropriately. Bear in mind, in a show called Due Process, that even those uh, employees are entitled to due process. And with a massive lawsuit against his city pending, Mayor Smith insisted that the Turner case is not typical of the way his police department does business. In any system uh, of business or government, sometimes systems fall down. And the, the one thing that comes out of a tragedy is that you can try to reform those systems so they don't happen to anyone else. And that's what our quest is. But that may be little comfort to Erica Turner. By the time police showed on April the 4th, Saunders was gone. There's just no credible, valid argument that could be made that if officers were dispatched, he would have been arrested and what happened on April 11th would not have happened. Erica Turner and her baby named Jada released apparently unharmed late this afternoon. I think it was seven hours before he let me go. I know he released me, it was, it was three o'clock. He came in my house at 6.30. But it may have been his arrival one week earlier that set the stage for this drama, and that's what this township is still trying to live down. Domestic violence oftentimes ends up in, in death. And it's a very, very serious thing. And they have a, apparently a very cavalier attitude, um, or, or, or some individuals do, about it in, in Irvington, in Irvington, New Jersey. Why do you not have police officers? You have to take that out with the mayor. We really do not have nobody. And I'm not lying to you, nobody. I took responsibility as the leader of the township because of the tragic situation and said, here's the information. It's not pretty, it's not pleasant, I don't like it, and I think this is some of the things we're going to be doing relative to it, and, and that's what we did. Ironically, the Erica Turner story unfolds at a time when official attention is finally focused on domestic violence, when official policy in Irvington and throughout the state is to treat a woman's calls for help in a really serious way. Now, whether it always works like that, well, that is another story. And it's a story we will pick up with our guests, a cop turned battered woman advocate and an academic who studies domestic violence, each with his own take on whether the system lets its victims down. So stay with us. In the inner city areas, I don't think they respond fast enough in the inner city areas. I think the, um, they don't see that as a priority. Well, you know, it's a tough situation, domestic violence, because it's a he said, she said kind of thing, and uh, I think the cops do the best they can. Try to look at it from both points of view, you know, husband, wife, who's right, who's wrong. I think they do a decent job. It depends on the type of person that's behind the badge that you're dealing with. I mean, if he is a person that already experienced domestic uh, violence when he was growing up, he's going to respond immediately and take the appropriate action. Knowing a few people who's been through it, um, they probably don't suspect that it is as severe as it is. It's a very serious matter, and it's become more public recently that I'm sure and hopeful that they do take it very seriously and respond quickly. There is a public perception that victims of domestic violence are treated differently than other victims. But is it true? And if it is, could there be any legitimate excuse? We may get some very interesting answers from a panel that consists of two men, both actively involved in the problems of domestic violence and official response. But as one expert told us, battering is a man's problem. We had invited a representative of the State Association of Police Chiefs, also a member of the Supreme Court's Domestic Violence Working Group. After seeing our package about Irvington, that representative chose to leave. But Anthony Winchats was a Bridgewater police lieutenant before he became the Domestic Violence Response Team Coordinator at the Resource Center for Women and Their Families. He will be in the studio. And with us from Newark, Evan Stark, an associate professor at Rutgers and a forensic social worker who specializes in cases of domestic violence. We're glad you're both here. Anthony, let me start with you. 
uh, we looked at a situation in Irvington. Uh, and in that situation, the police never showed up. Mm -hmm. um, is that an anomaly? Is that something that's so odd that it isn't part of the larger picture of domestic violence? Or does that happen sometimes, a failure of response by local police? Well, it can happen, but it's not the usual situation. Usually, the police put domestic violence calls as a priority call. All right, let me, let me address that. One of the things that I think most people know, although we'll explore it a little bit today, is that frequently victims of domestic violence wind up not pressing complaints, and maybe even sometimes police officers do self-help, take the guy, take him to his grandmother's house or some other place, and maybe over time that kind of winding up of these circumstances may lead police to not give domestic violence calls the high priority that you and others who've studied the problem think they should. Is that an issue in terms of police training and police organization? Well, I think it does become a problem for police officers. It's, it's sort of a time management problem. Police officers have that type A personality, and they want to handle calls quickly, efficiently. They want to resolve them. They want positive closure on them. And that's not always the case in a domestic violence situation. So over time, is that one of the issues that people like yourself with law enforcement background, but involved on the batter's woman's side, are interested in focusing on in terms of training and procedures. Oh yes, obviously. Uh, I'm gonna come back to that, but Evan, let me bring you into this. Uh, there is, I think, now part of the popular culture a notion that it's frequently true that victims of domestic violence will back away from pressing complaints or filing, following through with the system, even if they've been treated to some pretty serious violence. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's uh, um, largely a myth, Raymond, for two reasons. Okay. First of all, all in New Jersey, as in almost every other state now, uh, we arrest in domestic violence cases not dependent on whether a victim complains, but whether there's probable cause uh, that a crime has been committed, as there was obviously in Erica's case that we saw today. So the first issue that you have to realize Well, is let me stop you there, Evan. If, in fact, you are saying we are not in domestic violence cases, focusing primarily on what the victim says, but on everything we know that may give us probable cause, that's a little bit different. Why do we need that approach, which is also reflected in Anthony's manual, if there isn't a tendency sometimes for victims to back away from complaining? Well, first of all, we train our prosecutors and our police officers to collect evidence at the scene uh, such that even if a victim is not able uh, to cooperate uh, in a prosecution in a domestic violence case, that that case can go forward. And in those areas like San Diego, for example, where they had to try cases on the assumption that the victim will be uncooperative, they're getting conviction rates of 80 and 90 percent. But I guess and my, the question is, goes, my question goes to that assumption. Why is there that assumption? Yeah, because, it must have some basis in reality. I mean, the thing that most people don't understand, one of the questions you asked uh, to start was whether domestic violence was like any other crime, whether it was treated like any other crime is one issue, but is it like every, any other crime? Is it like stranger assaults, for example? And the answer is no. And the major reason it's not is because it's the only only crime where the assailant not only has intimate and personal knowledge of the victim's behavior, but may actually, and almost always does, as in this case in Irvington, have access to that victim. So you're dealing with a level of victim intimidation of what we used to call victim or witness tampering that really is not an issue of any, we're near the magnitude, well, the same magnitude in other cases. So we assume in a domestic violence case that that uh, offender is going to try to either get the victim to drop charges or not to press forward or not to appear and in the best situation. All right, Evan, Evan let me ask yeah. Anthony, let's assume, I assume that you're agreeing with Evan's assessment yes. of the complexity and the difference in this kind of complaint. Then the question is, how do you train cops to deal with this circumstance, which is different. In, in 30 years as, as a uh, criminal defense lawyer, I know, for example, that if you see, if a police officer sees two guys engaged in some kind of combat, it seems to be equal, nobody's really hurt, and the guys say, let it go, that frequently police officers will say, okay, as long as you guys go opposite directions, I'll let it go. They use that judgment. This sounds like an area we have to train people to move away from those instincts. Well, it's very important that the police officers understand the dynamics of domestic violence and the complexities of the relationships and the complexities of the response that victims will elicit after being involved in a domestic situation. Oftentimes they're intimidated into not wanting to pursue it. Oftentimes they take on a, their own defense mechanism. Um, they don't want to escalate the problem. They know what makes them safe. They know what comes next. And they're not, they're not always willing to 
bring that out toward the, to the police because the police have an obligation and I think a lot of victims understand that the police obligation may be to make that arrest or may be to take that enforcement action that they're not necessarily comfortable with and that's part of the problem. Well, well, let, me, let me extend it beyond the immediate police officer. One of the things that I think we may learn from Irvington, and it appears the mayor is taking some actions to correct and learn from that circumstance, is the issue of whether even a dispatcher should have a sense of priorities. You've actually authored a manual, and I think our viewers have seen parts of it, where you talk about the dispatcher's response and that domestic violence complaints should be treated as a form of violence and not as something with a lower level of priority. Well, uh, the dispatchers are required to be trained in domestic violence and their, and their role in, in, the, uh, in this response to the call. Um, they are the first contact that a victim may have with the police department. So they really have a lot of decision-making process going on with them. They have a lot of concerns. They have to gather a lot of information. They have to make a lot of value judgments right off the bat. Now, you've been involved with standards and what should happen. Are you satisfied that across the board, by and large, that what should be happening is, in fact, happening? These training of people in a way to move against their instincts and what they may have learned growing up? I think it is. I think we're putting a lot of training out there for police. Uh, there is our mandatory training requirements that they are indeed um, adhering to. And uh, we, the information is constantly being revised so that we're not leaving them unattended. And Raymond, as you can deal I, with victors, are yeah. you finding that to be true? Can I get in here, uh, Raymond? First yeah. of all, I want to dispel the idea that when police arrive at the scene, most of the time, it's a he said, she said situation. Like the case in Irvington, more than half the men we're arresting in domestic violence assaults now are not even sharing a, a house or an apartment with the woman they're assaulting. So we're not talking about ma married people for the most part. About 70, 80 percent of the women involved in these cases are single, separated, and divorced. And like I say, the majority of the men may not even be living with the women at the time they're assaulting them. So you're dealing with uh, a situation where an outsider is coming in. now. You know, th there are complications in a domestic violence case, and this is why we want police to try to figure out who's the primary aggressor. Uh, obviously, the dispatcher needs to give a high priority to domestic violence calls, but I'm going to say something very shocking, I think, to your audience, which is that even if police make an arrest, and I would say even had they made an arrest in Irvington, uh, that man in New Jersey, and probably every other state in the United States has about the same chance of going to jail for a significant length of time as you do of winning the lottery. Right, before we get to that, let me ask this. Isn't it true, though, that only about a third of the calls for domestic violence complaints re result in arrests? Well, and isn't that it's, fairly much, low? it's much lower than a third. Okay. And only about so half that's a decision made at the scene. That isn't the, what happens in the judiciary afterwards. That's correct. Technically speaking, technically speaking, as I indicated earlier, New Jersey is a state in which if there's probably cause that a crime has been committed, a domestic violence arrest should be made. But in about 30, 40 percent of the cases, as in the Irvington case, by the time the police arrive, the man is not there. But instead of putting the onus on the police, and I know there are problems, and certainly this situation we saw in Irvington, which the mayor was shocked by, would shock the public. Uh, if it happened generally. But instead of putting the onus on the police, I think what we have to recognize is that the police are enforcing the law. And the problem with the law is that the law doesn't recognize the seriousness of domestic violence. The law treats each incident of domestic violence as a separate crime, when the reality that that woman was facing in Irvington was that there had been dozens, and in many of my cases, there have been hundreds of distinct assaults or other offenses right. committed. Let, let, me, let me see if Anthony, who comes at this from at least with at least a law enforcement background, do you agree that that's true, that there is a tendency not to treat these as continuing events that, where the history is relevant and that the system, the court system in particular, doesn't treat them as seriously as they should? Well, I think the investigation a process that police officers apply here, uh, they investigate the incident at hand. Uh, and oftentimes, as Evan said, it's much more complex than that. Uh, someone may have been But I'm trying to get to the next phase. Evan has suggested that, by and large, his criticism is not of the police response on the scene, but of what happens subsequently in the system that failed.
else to fully understand the need to look at the history and, and the, the law the that the police and have the to operate out. Fair enough, I, but I just wanted to know whether I, you... And, and I, would, I would tend to agree with that, but yes. He, all right, but here's the question. How is it then that police would not be influenced by their experience with a system that you say is not responsive at the back end? Why would not that influence them into saying, well, why should we take these with that level of seriousness if the guy's going to be back out tomorrow with the same danger to the you're absolutely, enough? You're absolutely right, Raymond, that if you go to a traffic court, and unfortunately I've had some opportunity to go to traffic courts in New Jersey lately, uh, and you sit there while the domestic violence court, uh, cases are heard, they're treated like the lowest form of misdemeanor. Uh, now, if police see that the man they're arresting, uh, and had they made an arrest in Irvington on a violation of a restraining order, it's likely that would have happened there. They see that the man they're arresting is back on the street in 24 hours or maybe even in less time. They go, their morale is going to be low and they're right. going to hesitate Let, before they make an arrest right. the next time. Let me ask you another question, which is, do either of you think that either class or race or status makes a difference in terms of either the treatment on the initial police arrival or down the line? Does it make a difference if it's a wealthy family in the suburbs or an inner city family where people may be scuffling economically? Does that make a difference in terms of how domestic violence is treated anywhere in the system? Well, if you're asking me, I, yeah. I can, historically, one of the reasons that we demanded and, and won uh, policies of mandating arrest. Remember, domestic violence is the only crime, the only crime, there's not, it doesn't apply to murder, it doesn't apply to robbery, it's the only crime in which police are mandated to arrest where they don't need a warrant to do that. And, and the reason we mandated arrest in domestic violence cases was because historically police would not intervene. And this was their lack of intervention was actually greatest in the black community and in the low-income communities. Has that changed? Do either of you think it's yes, changed? It, there's some evidence that it has changed, that where minority uh, uh, populations now, uh, where there's mandatory arrest, the arrest rates are beginning in domestic violence to approximate the proportions of minorities and low-income people in the population as a whole. In general, of course, most of the people, about 80, 90 percent of the people uh, who are arrested or incarcerated or involved with the police in our society are poor working people, not the affluent, not the middle class. Anthony, now I see the name of your organization includes the word family. We've tended to focus on women. Yes. How often are either children or perhaps elderly folks who are in the family environment the victims of domestic violence? Is it a stereotype to always think of women the adult woman in a couple of some kind as the victim. Well, we like to we apply the, the standard that children are always the victim if they are witness to domestic violence, if they are influenced by the domestic is violence. Is that in a high percentage of cases the children are around when it happens? Uh, yes, it is. Yes, it is, unfortunately. Uh, and children know what's going on. Oftentimes, uh, police officers will tell us, or their records will indicate, uh, as in the report, were children present and they may check off the box no because the children were in the bedroom or they were in some other portion of the house they weren't physically in the presence of the of the argument or the or the uh, battering but the reality is they know what's going on. Right. Well, let me ask you this. Evan seems like he's pretty critical overall about how the system handles domestic violence and has articulated some. What's your sense of whether you're satisfied with where we are, given the fact that we've been talking about it, public policy for 25 years? Where do you think we are? Are we really making progress, or, and are we close to where we should be? Well, it's, it's very difficult to say, because I think we have made a lot of changes in the system. We've come a long way, but I don't know that we're making big Promise. What would you change right now if you're the emperor of New Jersey, not even the governor? I think I would like to see more emphasis put on prevention of domestic violence rather than the response that we have to prosecute. What does that prosecute. mean? How do you do that? Changing the culture. Changing the culture of, of society to revalue. That's pretty deep, Anthony. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't know where to start. I mean, that's where what do the you emperor start? Would do. Oh, that's <laughs> what the emperor would do. Is there any particular technique or approach you can think of that quickly tell us about, and I'm going to ask Evan the same question, uh, that would be a good start on changing the culture in a preventative point of view? Well, I think one of the things we're doing right now is we're looking at uh, who are the perpetrators, you know, and rather than punish the perpetrators, how do we change the perpetrators? How do we make the perpetrators Figure take responsibility? Okay. The perpetrators, uh, you know, in, in the majority of cases, are men. Okay. Evan, Evan Anthony's been deposed as emperor. What's the single change you would focus on if you could only do one, but you could do it with certainty? Well, the first thing and the most important thing we need to do is to develop a law which criminalizes what is actually happening in homes where women are being battered. 
And I want to tell you, and, and I think your viewers need to understand, I have not met, out of the hundreds and hundreds of women I have worked with over the years, I have not met one who didn't tell me that violence wasn't the worst part, that the worst part were the forms of taking her money, uh, this is, this is dramatic, and I hate to end on this note, but we're out of time, and I've just got to end by giving thanks to Anthony Winchatz and to Evan Stark. That's Thank it you, for Raymond. this edition of Due Process. But you'll want to join us next week for still another serious look at law and justice. Till then, for Sandy King, all of us here, I'm Raymond Brown. Thank you for watching. Turner and her baby named Jada released apparently unharmed late this afternoon, but still a lot of commotion at the Overlook condominiums in Lepatcong in Warren County, New Jersey. A police chase ended here after a child abduction Amber Alert at 7 o'clock this morning, more than 50 miles away in Irvington. Cops say Almuda Saunders went to his ex-girlfriend Erica Turner's home on Maple Avenue, got into some sort of an argument. Her father came over and police say Saunders shot and injured him, took Turner and their four-month-old daughter Jada in this light-colored Honda on a high-speed chase west on Route 78. Then Saunders led cops here to where his relative lives. I'm thankful to be alive. I'm thankful that my father's alive because it could have it could have got really ugly, really. Um, it's people's lives. This is my life. This is my family. And when people call out for help, they don't want to hear we don't have any cars. Major funding for due process provided by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law, and by the Fund for New Jersey, a private foundation focusing on New Jersey public policy issues. Additional funding provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual and online legal reference, elaw.com.